Thank you, choir. Dan Rivers bought two jet skis this summer, and since I'm his friend, uh, I, he invited me out several times on them. And he, one of his jet skis is that older kind where you, you actually stand up on them. You, you, have to get, you have to get up on it to stand up. The thing is you can't, you can't stand it up on it from the get-go because it doesn't, it'll, it'll topple. You have to go and then get yourself up on it. And uh, it's, uh, it's, it's a lot of fun, but it, you have to exert yourself to get up on it because you have to, you, 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 you hit the throttle while your legs are dragging behind and, and, uh, and, and the... The nozzle, the wake. What, what? Yeah. What? What's that thing pushing it out? The the jet. It it's coming at a very uncomfortable spot, you know, when your legs, and it's and the more and the, and the, really the more you throttle, the better chance you have on getting up on top of it. And so you really have to go. But the problem is your legs are dragging behind, and 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 the water's pulling your legs back. But so you really, it's good thing that I have massive arm strength, because you really need all your arm strength to pull against this to get up on the thing. But after a while, even my massiveness fails. And so I would always, I would drive it real close to the, to the beach so that, you know, I wouldn't have a far, because basically when you fall off and you no longer have the strength to get on, you just kind of drag yourself in with your legs dangling. And Dan's like, get back out there, man. Get back out there. And I'm like, I've got nothing left to give. He says, no, it's so much fun. Just get out there. And when, once you get out there, it's going to be great. But don't you see, Dan, I can't get on the thing anymore. My arms are aching. There's nothing left to give. I think uh, the thing is, you can't give what you don't have. You can't give what you don't have. When there's no strength left, you just can't give anymore. When there's no life left, when you're out of gas, you can't, you can't go any further. I think we come to this in faith, in our own spirituality, we come to this point at times when there's simply nothing left to give because there's just no strength left. There's, no, there's nothing feeding you. There's nothing nourishing you. That There's nothing left. Jesus says this in John chapter 7. I invite you to turn to John chapter 7. I think we get, this, we get to this spot physically and we get to this spot emotionally where, where there's nothing left to give. You can't give what you don't have. And we also get to this place spiritually. But Jesus says this, something very interesting in John 7, beginning in verse 37. He says, On the last day of the festival, the great day, while Jesus was standing there, he cried out. And he said, Let everyone who is thirsty come to me. And let the one who believes in me drink. And then he says this, he quotes the scripture, he says, As the scriptures have said, out of the believer's heart shall flow rivers of living water. Everybody say that. Out of the believer's heart comes rivers of living water. Now he said this about the spirit, which believers in him were to receive, for as yet there was no spirit, because Jesus was not yet glorified. So I was, this is a fascinating verse to me. I was thinking about this. First of all, I looked at the scope of this verse. Out of the believer's heart this shall flow rivers of living water. Not like, not like trickles or, or drops or, or creeks but, or streams, but rivers. I mean, what Jesus believes will come out of our hearts is this amazingly awesome flow of water, of, of life. That, that's what Jesus wants, but how come it, it gets to the, we get to the point where we, we, nothing's coming out of us? We get to the point where there's absolutely nothing left to give. And that, that was interesting to me, just the scope of how much Jesus expects to be, how much life he expects to be flowing out of our heart. The other thing was, was just this word believers, that he expects it of believers. Like, not people who just like have mental assent to God, like people who like, I acknowledge that God exists or I, I, I acknowledge that Jesus died on the cross, but it's, so, it's like belief in this sense means more like out of the one who's entrusting their life to God. You know what I'm saying? There's kind of, a, I think sometimes we get that confused about belief. We, it's not just, I believe in gravity, but you know what else I do? I trust in gravity. So when there's a piano coming out of the window on the third story and I'm walking down the street, I, I believe in gravity, 
but I also trust it enough to change my way, right? I, I walk around. This is, that's what I want you to think of when we think of the word a believer, a truster, someone who has reorganized their life because they, they trust in the life that God has for them. It's out of that kind of life that streams of living water will flow. That was fascinating to me. Uh, but also what was very fascinating is that Jesus was quoting something here. It's, he says, As the Scriptures has said, out of the believer's heart shall flow rivers of living water. It's in quotes. Do you know that when, if you all have your Bibles open, do you know that when it's in quotes, you can, also find, you can often find out like where it's quoted from? You can go down to the bottom and there's little references, you know, just like we do in your term paper at school. Little, there's a little reference here. He's quoting something. He's quoting the Old Testament. You know, I looked this up. I looked up, mine says, mine says Ezekiel 47. And I went to Ezekiel 47, and not once does it say that. Not once does it say, out of the believer's heart will flow rivers of living water. Jesus said something, and it didn't say something there. So what's going on? So then I looked up on, the, I googled it, right? Because if Jesus doesn't know it, let's Google it. <laughs> and I couldn't find this exact quote, and maybe, I'll, maybe I just can't find it, but I can't find this exact quote anywhere. So Jesus is taking, this is just for you to know, that Jesus is interpreting Scripture is what he's doing. He's gone to Ezekiel 47, verses 1 through 12, and he's kind of summarized it. He's, 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 I mean, I guess he can interpret his own word, right? So let's go to Ezekiel 47 and read about that. Let's see what it says there. Now, Ezekiel was a prophet who lived in about, I don't know, 586-ish B.C., before Christ, and he uh, was prophesying the destruction of Judah, the holy city in Jerusalem. He was prophesying the destruction of the temple and the city of Jerusalem. Their walls would come tumbling down. The, he was prophesying that, that another kingdom would overtake him. The Babylonian Empire would come down and, gra- and destroy the city and haul all, everybody off into uh, exile. That's what he prophesied against. And God gives him a vision. God gives him a vision. Here's the vision in, in 47. Ezekiel 47. These aren't in your bulletin. Uh, we're coming to those. Uh, Ezekiel 47. It's a vision now. Then he brought me back to the entrance of the temple, the temple in Jerusalem, the holy city. There, water was flowing from be- below the threshold of the temple toward the east, for the temple faced east. And the water was flowing down from below the south end of the threshold of the temple, south of the altar. Then he brought me out by way of the north gate and led me around on the outside of the outer gate that faces towards the east. And the water was coming out of the south side. Going on eastward with a cord in his hand, the man measured 1,000 cubits and then led me through water and it was ankle deep. From there again he measured 1,000 more and led me through the water and it was now knee deep. Again he measured 1,000 and led me through the water, and it was up to the waist. Again he measured 1,000, and it was a a river that I could not cross, for the water had risen. It was deep enough to swim in, a river that could not be crossed. He said to me, mortal, have you seen this? Going on. Then he led me back along the bank of the river. As I came back, I saw on the bank of a river a great many trees on the one side and on the other. He said to me, this water flows towards the eastern region and goes down into the, to the, to the Ar- Arabah. I got that crossed out with my notes. That's the Dead Sea. It goes down into the Dead Sea. And when it enters the sea, so in the Dead Sea it's called that for a reason, no life, salt, okay? The sea of stagnant waters, the water will become fresh. Whenever the river, wherever the river goes, every living creature that swarms will live and there will be many fish once Once these waters reach there, it will become fresh and everything will live where the river, everything will live where the river goes. People will stand fishing beside the sea from Engedi to Inaglam, and it will be a place for the spreading of nets. Its fish will be of great many kinds, like the fish of the great sea, Mediterranean. But its swamps and marshes will not become fresh. They are to be left for salt. 
On the banks on both sides of the river, there will grow all kinds of trees of food for food. Their leaves will not wither, nor their fruit fail, but they will bear fresh fruit every month because the water for them flows from the sanctuary. Out of the believer's heart flows water, so flows living water. Is that what I, is that what I said? <laughs> Out of the believer's heart shall flow water, rivers of living water. Thank you. But here, listen to what it says. Because the water for them flows from the sanctuary. Their fruit will be for food and their, and their leaves for healing. Okay. So, this is so awesome. I, this, this, this text is so awesome because look at what's happening. So this vision is that from the sanctuary, from the temple, from the holiest of holiest place, there's water flowing outside the holy city, down the steps, down the gates, and out the walls, and anything that it encounters. It's going all the way from Jerusalem, all the way to the Dead Sea, the deadest place the earth has seen. And from there, and from these waters, everything around it just comes to life just comes to life. Everything it touches just springs forth life. Jesus now interprets this for us 600 years later. And it says what, what, what Ezekiel's vision was about the city, you know, it was about the city, it was about the holy city, it was about Jerusalem, it was about the temple. But what I want to say that this, this is coming to fruition today and not, not out of the temple but out of the temple of your heart. That out of your heart shall flow these rivers of living water. That everything that comes out of your heart will breathe life into other people. I mean, this is a big expectation that Jesus says on us. This is how this prophecy will be fulfilled. Not in the temple in Jerusalem, which is no longer there, but it'll, be, it'll, be, it'll come to fruition out of us because we have been baptized in the Spirit, and that Spirit becomes a source of our living water. You get, are you inspired? I can always get you to say yes. I don't know if it was true. But what I want to say is this. Are you a believer? I think that's the problem right there. That, that, that faint yes. <laughs> right? Because I don't know that we're always sure if we are. It, have I reprioritized my life that I really trust in Jesus? So that I can say that out of my heart flows rivers of living water. That, that's part of the problem. But the other problem is this. Are you a believer that's no longer flowing living water? I mean, that, that happens to me a lot. The well just runs dry. You know, I... I I'll shout to the rooftops that I'm a believer. But I can't always say that from me is just flowing waters, a river of living water, you know? I can't always say that. At least I can't say that I, that I, I, I know my relationships. I know how I interact with you. I know how I interact with my family. And I, I know that everything I contact isn't always given life. In fact, some things I contact, some people I come in contact with, with, I actually take a little bit of their life away. You know, I actually deaden them, harm them. But the vision Ezekiel has, and the one that Jesus says will be for us, is that everything that flows out of us, and it will flow, will just give life to the relationships that we're in. And the things that we engage in, life will come. So how, how are you doing? Are you a believer? And is life coming from your heart? Is it flowing like a river? I think a lot of us, we, 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 we're believers just enough to say that we're believers. You know, we're just enough so we can, we can, we can claim uh, yes, I follow Christ, but just I want the, the bare minimum, you know, just enough so that we can claim that. When I mean, what happens, we quickly find ourselves in this incredible drought because we recognize that that's, that's not sustaining us. I, I was thinking about this example in the middle of Ezekiel when he talks about how the water levels become increasingly higher. First, when the first thousand yards out, he finds out that the water level is ankle deep. The next thousand, it's knee deep. 
And then the next time it's up to here. And then finally he says, you, if, if you're going to be taken by this flow, you just got to jump in and swim because you can't cross it. I think most of us spend our, our believing life and we, we, t- we want that water to flow from us. But the problem is we're, we're waiting in the kiddie pool. I took my nephew Sebastian to this, the Wyndham Municipal Pool this uh, last summer and uh, we, I took him to the kiddie pool and when we got to the kiddie pool, he's, he's uh, I don't know, he's about this high and he just, he, he can do whatever he wants in the kiddie pool and he, he, we didn't bring toys. But no problem. There's toys all around from other people, right? And he's just like, that's mine. You know, and, he, and he's waiting around. He's grabbing people's toys. Play, and, I, and I'm going around him trying to make sure he's not hurting anybody's feelings, you know, and that he's, he hasn't toppled over or anything. But I'm not really worried about him drowning, but I am worried about uh, he's just basically having his run of the place. And, you know, it's awkward when you didn't bring any toys to share, but he, every parent's like, that's okay, he can play with it, even though their kid's crying over there because, <laughs> because Sebastian ripped the toy out of his hand, you know. And you don't, and, it, and, you, and the whole time, who's in control? Sebastian. He's doing everything that he wants to do. And Uncle Fred is just is, is going around trying to clean up behind it. So then I took him to the five feet, Right? Was Sebastian running around in the five feet when he comes up to my waist? Five feet's about here. No, he, he's clinging to Uncle Fred. And now Sebastian goes wherever Uncle Fred goes, right? I'm in control of his life. I wonder if we're spending, one of the reasons that we in a drought spiritually is that because we're in the kiddie pool controlling everything about our life. We jumped in a little bit with God, you know, just enough to get our ankles wet so we can say, yeah, I trust in you. But we are still in control of this relationship. I think God's calling us into the deep end, you know, to just jump in where we have to rely on him and we can no longer rely on ourselves. Something to think about, not where I'm ending though today. So I was thinking about how we can all find ourselves in this, in our spiritual journey, wherever we are. Maybe we're early in the faith, maybe we haven't even made a decision to follow Jesus, but, or maybe we, we've been doing this, we've been going down this journey with Jesus a long time, this, this relationship with God has been going on a long time, but we come to these valleys, these, these times when we're just, when we're just spirit, we have nothing left to give. I can't give what I don't have. We come to this drought. And I was thinking, how do, you, how do you get out of that? How do we get spiritual renewal? Spiritual renewal. So I'd like to move on just to the first step. I'm going to go through this series, a three-week series. And the first step is this. I invite you to turn to Nehemiah. Nehemiah chapter 1. The first step is... Uh, is depicted, I think, in this great illustration from Nehemiah. Nehemiah now, he is a, a, he's a Jewish guy that he lived in the, he lived in the glory days of, the, of the, the southern kingdom of Judah. Israel, the northern kingdom, was already gone. Now Judah remained. And Nehemiah uh, uh, was taken when, the, when Babylon came down. Remember, Ezekiel was prophesying against his empire. Babylon came down from the north, and it took, it, it, it destroyed the temple, destroyed the walls, and took everybody off into exile. Now, now, Jewish people are no longer in Jewish land. They're all exiled all throughout the north from Assyria and then Babylon. And then there came a time when Babylon then was enveloped by Persia, the Persian Empire, and Nehemiah finds himself, a Jewish guy, way away from his homeland, way away from the God of that land, and he finds himself as a cupbearer for the king of Persia. He's serving in the king's quarters. That's what he's doing. That's where we pick up here. The words of Nehemiah, son of Hakaliah, in the month of Chislev, in the 20th year, while well, I was in Susa, the capital. One of the brothers, Hanani, came with certain men from Judah. And, and I asked them about the Jews 
that survived those who had escaped the captivity about Jerusalem. So these are Nehemiah's words. Some people come now, some of his brothers from that homeland long ago. They come and he recognizes them as brothers and he asks them a question. How bad is the city that I left? When they took me out of Jerusalem, the walls hadn't been torn down yet, but I've heard stories. How bad is it? How bad is the city of God? I asked them about the Jews that survived, those who had escaped the captivity, and about Jerusalem. And they replied, The survivors there in the province who escaped captivity are in great trouble and shame. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down, and its gates have been destroyed by fire. When I heard these words, I sat down and wept and mourned for days, fasting and praying before the God of heaven. I said, O Lord God of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments, let your ear be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer of your servant that I now pray before you day and night for your servants, the people of Israel, confessing the sins of the people of Israel, which we have sinned against you. Both I and my family have sinned. We have offended you deeply, failing to keep the commandments, the statutes, and the ordinance that you commanded your servant Moses. Remember the word that that you commanded your servant Moses. If you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the peoples. But if you return to me and keep my commandments and do them, Though your outcasts are under the farthest skies, I will gather them from there and bring them to the place at which I have chosen to establish my name. They are your servants and your people, whom you redeemed by your great power and your strong hand. O Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant and to the prayer of your servants who delight in revering your name. Give success to your servant today and grant him mercy in the sight of this man. At that time, I was a cupbearer to the king. So, Nehemiah, it's kind of confusing there, but Nehemiah hears, the, hears rumors from his friends that Jerusalem is in horrible ruins. It's destitute. It's been destroyed. And I love what Nehemiah does. When he hears the conditions of the holy city, he falls to his knees and weeps. And he confesses that he too has a part in the condition of that city. That what has happened to them is because of his sin and the sin of his family. All right. I wonder if that's a first step for us. If we're thinking that the, the walls within our heart are no longer flowing with living water, if we need to first get down on our knees and weep over them. You know, no change happens until we weep. I think someone put it this way. It says, you cannot rebuild the walls until you have reaped over the ruin. My seminary president, Maxie Dunham, always says, now let me say that again. You cannot rebuild the walls. You want that life-flowing water again to come out of the source of your heart that comes out of the spirit that lives in you? You cannot have that kind of life until you weep over the ruins of where you are now. You cannot rebuild the walls until you've wept over the ruins. This is is an important step. I think it's the first step in the 12-step program. Right? I wrote that down down somewhere. In the big book, the 12 steps for Alcoholics Anonymous and other 12-step programs, we admitted we were powerless over fill-in-the-blank alcohol, That our lives have become unmanageable. You've got to somehow own the situation. If you're spiritually dry, what's your ownership in that? You cannot rebuild the wall until you've weeped over the ruins and, and claimed ownership. Acknowledge that you're ruined right now, that things are destitute, and that you need help. There's no getting help until you admit that you need help, right? I was thinking about this when I was at the YMCA last week. What happened was, I was in the steam room, in the men's locker room, and I I like to shave in there, and I dropped my razor behind the bench, and it fell to the ground. I'm in all my glory. So, in the steam room at the Y, people are coming in and going at at all times. There's no one in there now. 
But I'm thinking someone could come in at any time, and I, it's uncomfortable to bend over when you're in all your glory and need to pick up something. You know, it just is. It doesn't look nice. And, you know, at the Y, we pretend that it doesn't matter, you know. Yeah, I'm naked. It doesn't matter, you know. It's all good. But, uh, but now I'm going to have to be very uncomfortable to get this thing. And so I did the smoothest smooth possible, as fast as possible. Get down under, grab it, and then in, in case the door opened, you know, like it's all good. Just stretching, you know. And, uh, and no one came in. But I thought about the great length I would go to to hide the fact that I was naked. The great length that we go to the high, to deny, to deny our, our destitution. We can't have this. Jesus says, the, out of the believer's hearts flow rivers of living water. We, that won't happen again for us if we're in a drought until we begin to get honest about the drought that we're in, that we're in this place of destitution. This restlessness. The first step is admitting that we have a problem and taking that to God. If you want any kind of life to flow out of you and bring life to others, which is what we want, we want to be people that bring life to others. I get so upset with myself when there's nothing left to give another person. Or when I see myself not building up someone, but tearing them down. But if we want to have that kind of life that flows from the sanctuary of us, that comes from the flow of God towards us, we want to have that kind of life, it's going to, we're going to have to start acknowledging that the container is not fit to hold the water. It, it's the first step towards Jesus, period, at any time in our life. The first step we've ever made to Jesus had to be the step of repentance, the step of acknowledging our sin and choosing to turn towards him. But it's also the step for spiritual renewal now. It always comes from us acknowledging our destitution. Oswald Chambers says this. Can we put up that Oswald Chambers quote? The greatest blessing spiritually is the knowledge that we are destitute. Until we get there, our Lord is power, powerless. And could it even be that God is creating our destitution right now? That he is making us restless? There's a story in the Gospel of Luke where this blind beggar comes up to Jesus and says, Jesus, Son of David, have mercy on me. And everybody around him says, be, be quiet, blind man. Be quiet. And, he's, and so he gets even louder. Jesus, Son of David, have mercy on me. And they're like, can, can you keep this guy quiet? But eventually Jesus hears him calling and says, let him through. And he heals him of his blindness. And I thought to myself, well, the, reason, the only reason he got healed of blindness is because he acknowledged his blindness. And he thought, and someone walked by who he knew could do something about it. But Jesus would have never healed him had he never acknowledged that he needed healing. The first step for us back to the kind of life where our life is just radiating waters of li rivers of living water is coming to grips, not denying, not trying to look good, but coming to grips with our current ruin. That the walls are down and they need to be rebuilt. And we had a part in the reason that they're destroyed in the first place. It's the first step towards spiritual renewal. Let us pray. God, in this room there are people at all sorts of levels in their spiritual journey. Some are on a spiritual high and everything they touch is just like was envisioned in Ezekiel. Just flowing from their heart out of their deep trust in you, is coming life. But there are others who are just like, wow, I'm, I'm full and then I'm empty and I'm full and I'm empty. It's never flowing. Or maybe they're just in the kiddie pool. Would you help them acknowledge where they are? 
And then give them the strength, the courage, because it takes courage to, to turn it over to you. And to go into deeper into relationship with you. It's out of their heart. Out of their trust in you. Will you help them change things in their life? Or that reprioritize it? So that their heart is really a believer's heart. One that trusts in you more than anything else. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.